Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome. I'm Professor Bridget Byrne, Director of Code, the Centre on the Dynamics of Eth Ethnicity, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, the final session in the conference organised with the Stuart Hall Foundation, Racial Inequality in Times of Crisis. And for those loyal followers, I'm sorry that you have to hear this another time. But anyway, well, COVID-19 highlights and exacerbated long-standing racial and ethnic inequalities in the UK across a range of social arenas. The ensuing crisis in living standards and the criminalising of protests could further entrench these inequalities. As the pandemic wanes, we're thrust deeper into a confluence of crises. Governmental inertia in response to the cost of living uh, crisis and climate change and a coordinated attack on the civil right to protest. While COVID-19 threw existing inequalities into sharp relief, these crises continue to disproportionately impact the lives of society's most vulnerable people. Racial inequality in times of crisis is a week-long online conference exploring the impact of present-day crises on racially minoritised people and communities in the UK. The event is hosted through a partnership between the Stuart Hall Foundation and the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, CODE. So um, we've invited researchers, journalists, practitioners working across the fields of sociology, history, art, media, activism, politics and healthcare to take part in a series of live online presentations and discussions that, have fo that are focused on a number of areas impacted by COVID-19 um, and the ensuing crises. We've already discussed education and policing, activism and LGBTQ plus rights and housing and recordings of those previous events will soon be on our websites, um, on both our websites. Today, today we're looking at health and healthcare. CODE, the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, to tell you a little bit about us, is a research centre based at the University of Manchester, but bringing together colleagues from six universities across the UK. Our current research programme is looking at COVID race and ethnic inequalities and seeks to provide a rapid response to the crisis that COVID presents um, and its social, cultural and economic impact on racially minoritised groups. At CODE, we're a multidisciplinary team using a range of different methods and seeking to provide robust evidence on the often lethal impact of racial and ethnic discrimination and inequality. We aim to provide new data in accessible formats to champion policy and institutional change by showing where and how racial inequality is present, how it builds on and extends existing patterns of inequality, and how this is experienced in everyday lives. We're very clear that the impact of racial and ethnic discrimination and disadvantage are one, not one-off events, but processes that happen across the life course and across all aspects of the lives of individuals and communities. We want to understand these processes, but also working with a range of partners, we want to think about how communities are challenging discrimination and disadvantage, particularly in the wake of Black Lives Matter. The Stuart Hall Foundation was established in 2015 by Professor Stuart Hall's family, friends and colleagues. The foundation is committed to public education, addressing urgent questions of race and inequality in culture and society, through talks and events and building a growing network of Stuart Hall Foundation scholars and artists in residence. The foundation works collaboratively to forge creative partnerships in the spirit of Stuart Hall, thinking together and working towards a racially just and more equal future. We're really pleased at CODE to have this partnership with the Stuart Hall Foundation. We take on Stuart Hall's call for the aim of academic research on race and racism to be to change the world by challenging racial injustice and discrimination. So I'm very pleased that today's panel is going to discuss the question that was central to the COVID crisis and which remains a critical area of importance, inequalities in health and healthcare. And I'm very pleased now to hand over to my colleague Dermi Kapadia, who will chair the event. Hi everyone and welcome to the fourth and final day of Stuart Hall Foundation's week-long online conference. Uh, as Bridget said, I'm Dermy Kapadia and I work at the University of Manchester in Sociology and I'm also a member of CODE and I'll be chairing today's event. So in today's event we'll be discussing the impact of various crises, including the COVID-19 pandemic, the cost of living crisis and the increasing privatisation of healthcare and to see what impact these have had on the health and well-being of ethnic minority people in the UK 
and the impact it's had on the accessibility and quality of healthcare that ethnic minority people receive. So we've got a fantastic lineup for you. Professor Dawn Edge from the University of Manchester. If you could just come on briefly, Dawn, just to so everyone can see you. And Professor Laya Bakaris from King's College London. And Jabia Butt from the Race Equality Foundation. Um, before I go on to introduce um, each of the speakers, uh, I just want to say for those of you who are on social media, such as Twitter or Instagram, please use the hashtags um, inequality in times of crises or hashtag Stuart Hall Foundation to tag your post so that our social media team can retweet or repost your thoughts on the event. And just to remind you of the structure of the event, each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes and then I'll chair a discussion with them for about 30 minutes. Following that, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions from the audience. So if you could please post your questions to the speakers via the Q&A box in Zoom, that would be great. And the chat function is also open for more general comments and for us to post relevant links to you. So do please check that box as well for links for work done by our speakers and by Code and the Stuart Hall Foundation. So our first speaker tonight is Laya Bakaris, Professor of Social Science and Health in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine um, at, King, at King's College London. And her research interests are in understanding the pathways by which discrimination and marginalization of people and places lead to social and health inequalities across the life course. And she has a specific focus on racism and heteronormativity as systems of oppression. So I'll hand over to Laya and the rest of us if we can turn our cameras off. If you go to slideshow, Laya, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. from beginning, yeah. Okay. Well, I like just zoom in Teams meetings and presentations, but here we are. Okay. Well, thank you, Dermy, for the introduction, and thank you to the Stuart Hall Foundation and to Code for organizing this conference. I want to talk about um, racism as a, a legacy of COVID, as a key lesson from the COVID pandemic in terms of how it shaped the landscape of risk for the unequal outcomes in terms of infection and mortality that we saw from COVID, but also the racialized responses to the pandemic, and then draw connections to the cost of living crisis and how racism is also shaping what looks like an unequal impact uh, of this crisis for minoritized ethnic groups. And I use Charles Mill's definition of racism as a political system, a power structure of formal or informal rule, socioeconomic privilege and norms for the differential distribution of material wealth and opportunities, benefits and burdens, rights and duties, which unfairly advantage white majority populations and unfairly disadvantage minoritized ethnic populations. And there are two things in terms of how racism has structured racial inequalities in terms of crisis, both the pandemic and what we are seeing now in terms of the cost of living crisis. And one is that ethnic inequities are predictable because we know what is causing them. Racism has shaped the landscape of risk for the unequal impact of the cost of living crisis on minoritized ethnic groups as it did for the COVID pandemic. And I will talk about this uh, in a bit. But the second thing that I wanted to discuss is that racial inequalities are avoidable. So they are preventable because we know the root cause of these inequalities, of ethnic inequalities. We can address racism and we can address the resulting socioeconomic inequalities in terms of income, employment, housing, pensions, fuel poverty, 
food poverty to prevent the unequal impact of the cost of living crisis, as we could have prevented the unequal impact of the coronavirus pandemic on minoritized populations. And so in terms of predictability, in April 2020, this was at the start of the pandemic, we were in the first lockdown. The business in the community published a report where they clearly stated that existing economic disparities could lead to a profoundly devastating and disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people from ethnic minority backgrounds, which we did in, indeed see happening. And they have this timeline um, of, of major crises starting from the 2008 economic recession, where they see that there were ethnic inequities, pre-existing ethnic inequities as we entered the 2008 recession in terms of employment, earnings, self-employment rates and higher housing costs and how the recession then magnified these pre-existing ethnic inequities in economic outcomes. And by 2010, there were ethnic inequities in terms of savings. So most minoritized ethnic groups having lower rates of savings or no savings at all when compared to white majority populations. And so these inequities in economic outcomes accumulate, they are long lasting, they are persistent. And by 2020, we enter the pandemic with pre-existing ethnic inequities in, in social and economic outcomes. So here, business in the community um, mentioned unemployment rates and rates of precarious employment, which we know were a risk factor for increased infection and mortality from COVID-19. But, you know, in the early starts of the pandemic, business in the community, but other think tanks, activists, um, academics had uh, stated similar things that unless we act, unless we address ethnic inequities and the racism that patterns these inequities, then we will see a disproportionate impact of the COVID pandemic. And business in the community focused on employment and precarious employment, unemployment, but over time, uh, racism had also shaped uh, differential risk and vulnerability to COVID in terms of increased risk of infection by leading to, to ethnic inequities in overcrowded housing, residents in deprived neighborhoods with high levels of pollution, poorly paid and insecure employment, and working in, in sectors that increase the risk of exposure to COVID. So these were risk factors for increased uh, risk of infection from COVID, but then once infected, racism also set out the disproportional vulnerability to poor prognosis, so increased mortality from COVID. And it did this by leading to ethnic inequities in health, in terms of asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, and coronary heart disease. And these were underlying risk factors in terms of health that led to, to COVID mortality. COVID-19 mortality. And racism leads to poor health uh, via different mechanisms, one directly uh, via a psychosocial mechanism, but also indirectly by leading to social and economic inequalities that then lead to ethnic inequalities in health. So we entered the pandemic with these pre-existing um, stark ethnic inequities in social, economic, and health outcomes. But then during the pandemic, the responses were also racialized including um, reduced delays and access to PPE for minoritized ethnic workers, including NHS workers, unequal distribution of the uptake vaccine, and then unequal consequences of public health responses to the pandemic to control the pandemic, like increased stop and search powers uh, used by the police, the consequences of school closures on children that uh, had free school meals, uh, consequences in terms of employment, and financial instability of uh, the continued lockdowns for minoritized ethnic populations. So these pre-existing inequalities and racialized responses to the pandemic resulted in what we now know are stark ethnic inequalities in COVID-19 mortality. And so you will have probably seen this graph uh, many times before. It just shows the increased risk of dying from COVID for uh, men and women from most minoritized ethnic groups compared to the white majority population. So in particular, Black, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and to some extent, Indian ethnic groups were disproportionately affected by the 
pandemic in terms of mortality as we see here. And the, the COVID pandemic did not also did not only impact on, on health related to COVID, but it also had consequences for other health outcomes, for example, in terms of the implications of bereavement and a worsening of mental health, but also magnified existing social and economic inequalities that are so crucial now for the cost of the, the cost of living crisis. And the Running with Trust recently published a report focused on ethnic inequities in the cost of living crisis, where they show that during the pandemic, ethnic inequities in poverty had magnified. So we enter now the cost of living crisis uh, with exacerbated ethnic inequities in health and social and economic outcomes. And this graph is also from this Runnymede Trust Report that shows ethnic inequities in fuel poverty as we enter winter. And so all minoritized ethnic groups are more likely than the white majority population to experience, to experience fuel poverty. 32% of uh, the white group will experience fuel poverty in winter. This is in contrast to 66% of Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups and over half of Asian and, and Black and populations will experience fuel poverty. So, you know, same as that we, we entered and left the 2008 recession with increasing ethnic inequities in health and the same happened in the pandemic. And this is what we are seeing now for the cost of living crisis. And just like the pandemic was not only a health and healthcare crisis, but it had wider social and economic implications. So is the cost of living crisis not only an economic crisis, and there are strong health implications of widening um, ethnic inequalities in, in economic outcomes. And there is a, a white evidence, a white body of evidence that documents strong associations between these economic indicators uh, of, the, of the cost of living crisis, like food poverty and fuel poverty, unaffordable housing, increased debt, and child poverty and how these are related to, to health outcomes and increasing health inequalities, including um, in a multitude of outcomes like cardiovascular disease, increased stress, worsening of, of mental health, mortality. And if we think of child poverty, uh, long lasting um, for and, and, you know, health and social outcomes in later life. And a worsening of population health plus the decreased investment or any disinvestment in healthcare settings will lead to an increased strain on the NHS. And oftentimes policymakers and, and some academics, because they observe outcomes at the individual level, like individual level health and individual level poverty, they relate individual level outcomes to individual level causes, so behavioral causes, for example. <clears throat> But we have to remember that the root cause of ethnic inequities in health and social and economic outcomes is this ongoing long-standing structural racism that has patterned racial inequities in terms of crisis over time and across several, several crises. And now it will do so in the cost of living crisis unless we intervene. And so I said before, ethnic inequalities are preventable because we know the root cause of ethnic inequities, which is racism. So we have to recognize the existence and the prevalence of racism in the UK to begin with, and also address uh, the way it structures differential access to opportunities and services and life chances in society. And then alongside addressing racism, we have to address the socioeconomic disadvantage um, that is caused by racism in terms of uh, ethnic inequalities and socioeconomic disadvantage. And uh, organizations like uh, Raise on the Agenda and the Running with Trust and the Health Foundation have published policy recommendations in terms of how to mitigate and address ethnic inequities in the cost of living crisis. And these include redistributing incomes through taxation or welfare policies, increasing benefits in line with inflation and prices, and supporting communities based on needs with fuel and, and food costs. And then also strengthening public services like the NHS, but also thinking about educational systems and social care systems. 
and then acting across the life course. So thinking not only how the cost of living crisis may be impacting the working age population, but thinking also about uh, childhood and then older populations as well. And then intervening so that we can reduce and address ethnic inequities across time and generation so that they don't further magnify in, in this cost of living crisis, like we see, well, like we saw in the COVID pandemic and we saw previously in the 2008 recession. Okay. Thanks very much, Laya. And it, I think it's really important in your talk that you kind of highlighted the importance of the interconnectedness of all these different domains in life and how they have an impact on each other. So it'd be good to pick that up in the discussion later on. But thanks very much for your talk. Um, so our next speaker is Jabir Butt, Chief Executive of the Race Equality Foundation. Jabi has gained an international reputation for the use of evidence in developing interventions to help overcome discrimination and disadvantage. His studies have been used to inform government thinking, including for interventions such as Sure Start. And a key part of his work is the Foundation's role in the Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which has seen the Foundation facilitate better conversations between the ethnic minority led voluntary sector and departments such as the Department of for Health and Social Care, NHS England, and Public Health England. Jabi was also on the Marmot Advisory Group supporting Sir Michael Marmot in the production of his recent report on the social determinants of health inequalities. So I'll hand over to Jabi now. Thanks a lot, Jabi. Thank you very much, uh, Damien. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. So before I start my presentation, uh, I, I just wanted to say what a privilege it is to, to be talking for the Stuart Hall Foundation. Um, I never got to meet Stuart Hall, but I was lucky enough to hear some of his lectures and obviously read much of his, his writing as well. Um, and it's important to recognise that that his searing analysis of how racism was shaping the lives of Britain's Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities was always accompanied by, by ideas on, on social action that you could take forward. To be honest, uh, though, um, I'm, I'm not sure I can reach his standards. Um, the reality is that while <clears throat> you always want to come up with solutions that are going to work, the experiences of COVID-19 and what has followed would suggest to us that we face a real challenge in terms of, of, of racial equality, not least the challenge posed by what our politicians are or aren't doing in terms of addressing racism. And I want to do, what I want to do with my time with you today is explore our experiences of racing issues to do with racism racial equality and the impact on health care uh, over the last couple of years. Set out what, are, what this has taught us about what's happening around policy and practice and its engagement with, with politics at the moment. And then reflect on what this means for addressing racism and racial inequality in, in the 2020s. While we're, we're all consumed by the cost of living crisis, and uh, that's quite right because it is impacting our communities at the moment. The reality is, is that what's taking place at the moment is actually going to shape much of our experiences over the next eight or ten years. And I, I think it's important to address that in that context. Firstly, just to go over ground that Leia has already covered, but it's important to, to recognize we were. Um, very active with with the various discussions around the uh, COVID-19 and its impact on Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. We published a briefing paper on March the 28th, which warned of the likely uh, disproportionate impact. And then we engaged with various parts of, of uh, the health response, whether it was with 
with the DHSC's work around supporting people with dementia, whether it was NHS England's work around mental health, whether it was Public Health England's work uh, around the response to uh, COVID-19. We often participated in those discussions. Most importantly, I chaired one of those sessions where uh, that were uh, arranged once the chief medical officer had asked for an inquiry to take place in, in uh, to try and understand what the disproportionate impact on of COVID-19 was on minority ethnic communities. And the, <clears throat> the session I, I co-chaired uh, with Professor uh, Steve Fenton raised a whole series of issues as to why that might be the case. Many of you will remember that when the first report was published in June, based on those consultations, there was a huge uproar about it, in, in particular because a chapter was missing from what was finally published. And there were often arguments as to why that chapter had been omitted, not least because it, it perhaps made the strongest argument that racism was part of it. What was lost in that furor was that actually that report itself contained uh, a lot of data on uh, uh, minority communities. But in many ways, it argued that the disproportionate impact was limited and actually could probably be explained away by the experience of deprivation or com co comorbidities. But with the new policy institute, uh, we looked again at the data that had been, been published. And one of the things we pointed out that what had been published in the report was the population fatality, uh, fatality rate, which was the rate that compared uh, uh, the chances of not only being infected, but also dying as a result of, of COVID-19. And it suggested a, a difference of between 10 and 12% between uh, Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and their white counterparts. But when you actually disaggregated that work and looked specifically at infection rate and then the rate of, of death as a result of infection, a different picture appeared, which suggested a much bigger disparity between those uh, Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities and their white counterparts. And this <coughs> uh, chart demonstrates the, the chances uh, of dying following a positive test and it takes into account deprivation. It's important to recognize that even the community that uh, is likely to have experienced the least amount of deprivation, that's the Indian and the other Asian group, even for them, uh, inf death as a result of infection was higher than their white counterparts. So it can't be that deprivation is, is the key driver here. Importantly, when we looked at the relative chance of infection by the ethnic minority group and sex, again, we demonstrated that infection rates for these communities were, were much higher. And as we argued in that paper, it's important to look at infection rates because that's one of the things that would drive our policy response. That's one of the things that would say, well, these are the steps we need to take to better protect these communities. And the reality is that this was rarely dis, uh, dis, uh, discussed in, in public until quite, quite late on in the pandemic, probably in, in July onwards, by which time many of the deaths had already uh, occurred. <clears throat> and th these were the results that we found uh, uh, in terms of the relative chance of infection and then dying given a positive test by ethnic minority groups showing the, the two risks combined uh, demonstrated the, the, the high risk. And this was true of, of people between the ages of 20 and 64 and in the people over, over the age of, of, of 65. So uh, uh, unlike the white counterparts for black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, the risk of dying was higher uh, across the age range. And these are some of the con uh, conclusions uh, we came to. Most importantly, that the pattern of being at higher risk when compared with white British counterparts is clear in almost all the data, including when deprivation is, is taken in, in, into account. <clears throat> 
at a similar time, we were also involved with, with the Care Quality Commission uh, in, in their response to, to looking at the impact of COVID-19 on, 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 on the health and care system. And in, in June of, of uh, 2020, the Care Quality Commission started to publish the COVID-19 Insights, which is a monthly uh, note that they would produce sharing data and analysis that they'd carried out. Those of you who, who want to will look at the, the first edition of Insight and note that none of the data uh, uh, dis is disaggregated by ethnicity. And when it was presented to us, we raised that question, why aren't you sharing this information? And the response was that the data they collected, for example, on uh, the notified deaths in, in, in residential care, while it required uh, uh, those uh, uh, care homes to provide ethnicity data, it was often poorly responded to, and therefore you couldn't break down that data. We argue with the Care Quality Commission that they needed to do something about this, that it wasn't good enough to say we can't, we can't do anything. And by the time the second report was published, the second issue was published, they had carried out a specific piece of work to look at to improve the, the reporting of, of, of uh, deaths by ethnicity. And uh, they produced two charts. The first on uh, uh, deaths of all adult social care services users due to suspected or confirmed COVID-19. And this is for that period from 10th April to 50, 15th May when, when deaths were, were rising dramatically. And it demonstrated that for, for for black adult social care users, something like the death rates were higher, as was the case for Asian in comparison to their white counterparts. And looking at residential care, again, the, those death rates were even higher, 54% uh, for, for, for uh, black, uh, black people in, in residential care, 49% for As Asian people in, in resi residential care. And the fact that the Care Quality Commission had responded to this was, was an important part because they continued to build on that, uh, that data. And even though the data grew, once the data grew, they continued to publish uh, uh, results that showed the disproportionate impact of, of COVID-19. However, the government's response was a clear one and was uh, clearly articulated in in the quarterly report on progress to address COVID-19, which appeared in October 2020. Uh, the expert that they, they had uh, to talk about this started to su suggest that actually didn't have anything to do, do with racism and that uh, the, uh, the disproportionate uh, impact was the result of other factors, factors that will be investigated in further COVID reports. Those who of us who actually read uh, the report itself will note that racial, uh, racial inequality and racism isn't mentioned in any of the 62 pages of, of the report, yet its presentation was very much along those lines that it was, it was uh, racism couldn't be a factor in, in identifying this. And uh, it comes, I think, to, to the heart of what we've seen during the, uh, the COVID-19 was that <clears throat> regardless of what the data started to demonstrate and built up or over that period, uh, we were presented with a picture by from, from government that actually racism wasn't playing a part and that other factors were, were the cause, including, as the layers already highlighted, individual behaviour, and uh, that, that was the case. And for us, it would be wrong for us to argue that nothing has changed but it has to be the case that in terms of health and care, health and care, uh, change has not been quick enough and, and is, is not embedded. And some of the data on, on the experience of care and the likely uh, outcome, uh, likely what's going to be demonstrated by the COVID inquiry, that healthcare in itself ended up being poorer for those communities is perhaps the latest demonstration of that. We arrived at that crisis with, with our protections already weakened. Uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, 
you know, uh, uh, use funding had been severely cut over the last uh, 10 years. Um, we've calculated that if if uh, it was getting its budget of 2010, it would be receiving about 93 million pounds a year at the moment. It's in fact receiving about 18 million pounds a year. And that was just one element of of those levers being undermined and and therefore the protections being weakened. But there have been many, many others as well. The uh, operation of the, the health and safety executive uh, uh, which failed to raise the issue of why risk assessments were being carried out of, of frontline staff, including healthcare workers. We also arrived at the crisis with leaders and organizations either ill-equipped or unwilling to act. Uh, it's not until uh, we saw all those uh, pictures appear on the front of the Guardian and other newspapers of healthcare workers be dying as a result of COVID-19 before NHS England decided to take action decided to actually look at whether or not uh, the, their, their workers were being put at, at adverse risk, minority ethnic workers were being put at risk. And where action was taken, it was likely the, re, uh, the result of Black Lives Matter as the bur uh, rather than the burgeoning evidence on disproportionate impact. It's the protest that young people led during the BLM demonstrations that actually engendered a greater response from uh, from policymakers and practitioners rather than the, the growing evidence. The political response of the governing party has been, been to double down on the claim that it's not racism that explains disproportionality. And the latest publication, Inclusive Britain, is just the first, latest demonstration that as far as they're concerned, racism isn't part of our experience. And I fear is also the going to be the thing that impacts their response to the current crisis on 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 cost of living and the continuing crisis on climate change the reality is that that disproportionate impact on on britain's black asian and minority ethnic communities isn't being factored into any response this, as you, uh, as I've argued, has often meant when protected and supportive steps have been taken, they're often in spite of government rather than because of, of government. There are many attempts by funders to support Black, Asian and minority ethnic-led voluntary organisations during 2020 and 2021, whether it was the National Lottery or whether it was local government. Was, this, was a response that came in spite of what uh, central government was doing rather than because of it. If it's not already the case, one lesson is that the evidence is not enough. Um, we as uh, those people analyzing the impact of COVID-19 and other crises will need to recognize that just demonstrating the, its disproportionate impact doesn't deliver the change that we're after. If there is another lesson, it is importantly that community action is the key driver of change. And we've got to get better at ensuring that we organize support and are part and parcel of that community action for to drive that change. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jabir. And um, that was great. And remember, um, just to the audience, if you do have any questions for Jabir, please type them in the Q&A box in Zoom and we'll collate the questions for the panel at the end. Um, so our final speaker tonight is Dawn Edge, who's Professor of Mental Health and Inclusivity at the University of Manchester. Uh, and she's the University of Manchester's first black woman professor. Uh, Dawn is also Director of the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Research Unit within Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Trust. And as a health researcher, Dawn is committed to using her research to reform policy and create more equitable, effective and accessible care, treatment and outcomes. Um, currently, Dawn leads a national randomised control trial to evaluate culturally adapted family intervention, or CAFI. This is a bespoke talking treatment which has been co-created with people of sub-Saharan, African and Caribbean descent, diagnosed with schizophrenia and related psychosis and their families. So I'll hand over to Dawn now. Thank you very much, Dawn. Oh, thank you so much, Dawn. And um, as others have said, it's a real pleasure, a privilege to be here. And I remember using Stuart Hall's work 
in my PhD. So I, I never had the privilege of meeting him, but his work has been instrumental in, in everything that I've done and in for my work since. So I'm just going to share my screen with you um, so that I can share these slides. And hopefully, um, yeah, so we're good to go, yeah? Hopefully you can see. Okay, so, so I guess we've just been having the conversations that we've been having and, um, and what we've seen over the last couple of years have really perplexed me, to be honest, because it seems as though over the years we've become really quite comfortable with the notion that there are inequalities in health and yet we have an NHS that was built that was birthed here right here in Manchester actually where, where I am um, this is um, what is now Trafford um, Stratford Hospital and that's where it started and the whole the whole thesis of the of the, the birth of the NHS was about eradicating inequalities and yet, what, nearly 80 years on, we're here having this kind of conversation. And many of you will be familiar with the work of Sir Michael Marmot and, um, and, and Leia Mensch has made reference to um, the this, this social determinants of health, and that's a phrase that, that Marmot's coined. And just to take some headlines, so you did the review in 2010, 2010 2020, you, you looked at, again at what had happened and you found that um, life expectancy had fallen, either flatlined or for some groups had actually fallen for the first time. That there was a widening gap, gap between the North and the South um, and declining health for the poorest 10% of women and rising mortality rate for men and women um, in the middle years and one of the causes for that is, is purported to be what are called deaths by despair so deaths related to suicide drugs and alcohol substance misuse and rising poverty so you know 23 percent and we know now know that, that 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 percentage is actually rising of children living in poverty in the uk so the, what happened in the pandemic and what we're seeing now has quite a long trajectory. It's, it's, it's not new stuff. It's been around for a while. And yet it seemed as though when we started to see what's coming out of the pandemic, when we started to see the health inequalities, A, there was the obfuscation of people who were actually denying that there was any relationship between um, the, the, the outcomes that we were seeing and race. But also it seemed to have taken people a bit by surprise which is really really surprising that you know given the weight of evidence that we had beforehand about the relationship between ethnicity urbanicity and a range of you know there are other conditions for example that only affect people from black asian and other minoritized communities so things like sickle cell anemia and thalassemia there are some there are some conditions that actually put people at greater risk but none of that seems to really have been taken into consideration and i'm really glad that jabir mentioned the, the tendency to automatically couple um inequalities with poverty and, and, and blackness and the and particularly around COVID with the rates with the, with the death rates because just thinking about the NHS 21% of NHS staff are from minority backgrounds but they're accounted for 63% of all COVID deaths and you would have seen when those deaths started when I think they really began to take traction was when they show that the first eight medics that died were all black or brown people and so, you know, we've um, layer in a talk as, as outlined some of the, the possible explanations um, around for, for the disproportionate impact of COVID on minoritized communities, including um, comorbidities. But it's really important to say that these things, as Javier showed so expertly in his presentation, were not just about old people. These were things that were happening across the life course. So um, black and brown people, were more likely to get COVID at an earlier age and in their middle ages, in the middle years, as, as opposed to um, white people. And really important to, to, to remind ourselves, something that we've always known is that there's what is called 
um, an inverse care law, which is linked to what's a social gradient, where health and wealth are inextricably linked, and those who are richest have the best access, the greatest access, the, 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 um, the quickest access to health care, and those who are poorest um, have the corollary. corollary. And it's interesting that we've only really, and not, and, and as Jibir has pointed out, not even all of us, we've only really be just begun to talk about the impact of race and racism. So the work that I do is primarily around, but not exclusively around mental health. And you know, we've known for such a long time that there's a disproportionate rates of diagnosis, particularly for serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and psychosis amongst black men in particular. And yet racism has not been part of the discussion about the etiology, about the causes of, of disproportionate rates of mental illness in some categories and in some groups. So one of the things that we're here to talk about, of course, is, is about the cost of living crisis and what that might mean. And, and I'm really looking forward to our wider conversation about this. But we know that already that Black, Asian and other ethnic minority households are, um, are going to be the hardest hit by the cost of living crisis, partly linked to the way um, people are employed. Um, so um, we know that people are who would like more like to be paid at hourly rates on zero hours contracts and so on not only are they more likely to, to be rendered unemployed, but even when they're in, health, in, in work, things like being able to, pay, to afford to pay for, um, to get to a, um, a health appointment is an additional financial burden when people are now having to, um, there are real conversations I'm hearing all the time about people talking about the choices between food and heat. And at some point it's going to be between food and health. And that's the irony is that that's where the, you know, the, as I started off by saying, that's what, that's what the birth of the NHS was supposed to have stopped. It was supposed to have meant that people's access to health care um, was equal, irrespective of their ability to pay. And what um, we've started to see is that um, everybody's concerned about, uh, about the impact on their, on their budgets, on, on their ability to afford food and heating. And as they were showing, you know, the impact of that, that if you live in a cold home, you're unable to heat it, the impact of that on respiratory conditions in particular. And what we're seeing here is already... Um, half of, of minority, people from minoritized com communities are talking about feeling anxious and depressed and linked to their concerns of the, their ability to provide food um, for their families. So you know, we're about to have a, a, a budget and it's been delayed, hasn't it? So it's 17th of November, I believe, we're going to have a new budget and there's a, a forthcoming comprehensive spend review, but the government is leaving us in no doubt that there's going to have to be cuts. And when there are cuts, and particularly sp public spending cuts, these are going to disproportionately impact people from racialized and minoritized background. That, that much is clear. And so it's going to impact in a number of different ways. So, for example, um, people who are now increasingly talking again about privatisation. So I don't know about you, but I, I know members of my, my social networks, very ordinary people who are now saying, I can't wait for an appointment. I'm going to use my savings if I have any, and I'm going to use those to go private. And more and more people are doing that because they're, they're desperate and that's only going to, to, to increase. Um, we know also that, um, that people that people from minoritized um, backgrounds make up a disproportionate percentage of the workforce in health and social in, in social care in particular and you know those are people that, those are often contracts that are zero hours and so again when there's an economic downturn there's a pressure on those people to not only to continue to work when they're unwell um, but also to to work for less less than or the very best the minimum wage and not really be in a position to advocate to have a living wage and we see also that with the nhs and other bodies outsourcing to, to um, services and really you know the equality and human rights commission have, set, have, set, have highlighted that that's really um, 
a way of uh, uh, part of the consequences of that is it, it, it avoids people having to adhere to health and safety regs and, and, other, and other things like that. So that means that people's health and safety are, are then more likely, to, more likely to be compromised. And we know that um, people who are able to, um, to pay for their care are going to get better quality care. And so as the, what happens then is, is people kind of vote, there's a migration away from, um, from people, from the places where um, pe the healthcare is already poor. So you just have to look at where GPs are located and look at where there are, there are vacancies. You have to look at just mental health trusts where they've got the highest rates of vacancies and they tend to be in those places where there is greatest dep deprivation. So the health workers want to work in places where can they, provide, they can provide good health care and for in those areas where that's least likely to happen people are voting with their feet leaving a bigger gap and also where there are NHS type based treatments where there's an element of, of needing to pay we're also seeing already that um, even before the pandemic but increasingly that people uh, there's low uptake amongst minoritized um, and poorer people so not just minoritized but also white people who are, who are unable to pay so and that is really evident in, particularly in, in dental care where you know as a dental hospital at, at my university and there are children who um who are having extractions even before the, the, they have their, their, their adult teeth so just to conclude before we start our conversations is just to say you know i guess what we most of us on this platform know is that the issue of inequalities in health um, in terms of the access to health care people's experiences in care and then the outcomes are long-standing and apparently intractable and whilst we have made some gains it now looks as though unless we, there's a real intentionality about this, that it's actually all of those are going to be reversed. And we've spent, as I mentioned with the moment, you'd already seen that happening just pre-pandemic um, because of over 12 years of, of this current government, there has been less and less real spending, real investment in health and health and care. And we saw those worst, worst thing inequalities pre-pandemic amplified during the pandemic and now with the aftermath of, of spending cuts and people's uh, inability to meet their nutritional needs, to be able to, to, to heat their homes. Um, it is really, in a, we're in a situation where it's likely to be, you know, the devil take the highmost. So those who are already at the back are the ones of the queue, as it were, as it were for, in terms of healthcare, being able to access the best quality care or the least likely, uh, the least likely to, to be able to, um, to weather the storms, the, um, both the economic storms that are coming and those that are going to be um, the result of the spending review and the spending cuts that we're going to see and how they impact on the health, on the health system. I think I'll stop there so that um, we can enter into our conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dawn, and um, thank you to the whole panel for their really well explained, um, detailed and interesting talks. If I could invite Jabir and Laya back now onto the panel, um, and I'm just going to pose a, a couple of questions to you before we go on to some questions from the audience. Um, so a, a lot of you mentioned kind of just how bad the situation was in terms of uh, people's health and the healthcare inequalities that we see for ethnic minority people. Um, and you highlighted how bad that actually was before the pandemic. So before, um, you know, March 2020, we already knew things were really bad for people. And a lot of us on this panel and people in the audience will know that one of the root causes of this is racism patterned at the structural, institutional and interpersonal levels. So do you think that there is more recognition now, here at the end of 2022, of the impact of racism on health inequalities and healthcare inequalities than there was at the beginning of 2020. So I'll go to Laya first, just because you spoke first, not for any other reason. I think they may, there is because of the, as Javier mentioned, the Black Lives Matters um, activism and, and movement so from a community ground up movement, there has been a greater 
mobilization around the role of racism in structuring ethnic inequities. But also, as Javier mentioned, the government is actively denying the role of racism. And this is shown in, in documents during the pandemic and after, but also in the responses and, pol and approaches to pandemic, but also to the cost of living crisis that Don mentioned. And so yes, I think there is a, a wider recognition in the general public, but this active denying of the role of racism by the government, I think that's what, where the real implications lie. Yeah. Does, uh, did you be or Dawn want to comment on that as well? Well, again, just to echo that, because I think if you have a government that's denying that racism is an issue and racism, let's be honest, certainly in the work that I've done, is always been put in the too difficult to do box. The issue of race and, and mental health has definitely been that is a really good example of that, where it's where those inequalities have just been reported about for 60 years, 60 or 70 years, there have been lots and lots of research published about that, but actually nothing done nothing about what are the solutions and no real analysis of why that might be a few theories thrown around so if you have a government that is actually saying actually there's nothing to see here then what you have is is commissioners and other people who are essentially let off the hook and they can focus on other things and i, and I think that's that's my that's the concern of most of us is that actually when you've got a government saying there's not a problem then where are the people going to go? Because policymakers and commissioners can't then advocate for getting more funding to fix a problem which the government says doesn't exist. Yeah. Dam, Dam is quite clearly the case that we, we talk more openly and more readily about racism and, and, and its impact on, on Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And, you know, at a policy level, it happens more often as well. Um, Marmot in 2010 virtually didn't mention racism at all, didn't mention minority communities at all. The 2020 report does a much better job at doing it. So that's been part of the change that's taken place. But I think if you look at, at uh, Rishi Sunak's elevation to prime ministership, it shows the, the confusion we have in discussing issues to do with, with race and racism. The assumption seems to have been, and lots of people tell me as an East African Asian, I should be celebrating the fact that a, a fellow East African Asian has made it to the to the top of the, the pile, as it were. And I keep saying, but but why? Why should I be celebrating this? Because my attempt to bring about change in, in racism isn't just to ensure that my children don't get treated the way I was treated 20, 30 years ago or still get treated now, but to ensure that the experience of racism isn't one that any child in this country has. And unfortunately, his elevation to prime ministership, it will almost certainly ensure that that isn't addressed. And therefore, what is there to celebrate? And I think until we're quite clear uh, if we're going to talk about racism, we have to talk about what we're going to do about it. We're, we're still going to uh, going to uh, allow some terrible things happening on a daily basis to continue. Yeah, thanks very much. And I think I think I would I would agree with that that we do have many more conversations about racism more generally and its impact on health in many more arenas than we would do. But the one arena that we really wish it would take place in at the kind of politicians level and getting into law, having a national race equality policy, having a national race equality agenda for the health service, that's what's missing. And it feels like that will be missing for quite a long time to come still. Um, so yeah, so thanks for that. One, I was just gonna post a, um, a link in the chat. So this is a new report that's been published today by the NHS Race and Health Observatory which shows ethnic inequalities in elective surgery. So this is routine surgeries or care that people have been waiting for. And it shows that some ethnic minority groups were much less likely to get this kind of routine care during the years of the pandemic. Um, and I think this relates to what Dawn was saying about um, the kind of quality and access to care that ethnic minority people have. And I think this report shows that some, some of these things are getting worse during the pandemic. 
Um, but I think one of the things that all of you talked about um, in terms of like healthcare systems, so Jabi, you talked about it in terms of the health and social care system as well, is that we don't always get the data that we want. So we want um, data so that we can say what the ethnic inequalities are, even though, as Dawn said, for 60 or 70 years, we've been banging the same drum, telling people what these ethnic inequalities are. But it seems that the people who produce the data still don't give us what we want. So what do you think it would take to convince people to produce healthcare statistics and health statistics um, so that we can actually accurately report on the ethnic inequalities that we've talked about today? Yeah, Don. So I think it would take um, us actually using some of the legislation that we've got. So, for example, we've got an Equality Act it's produced in 2010. It talks about um, a public sector equality duty on bodies like the NHS to make sure that there is not discrimination either directly or indirectly. And if you don't have the data that shows the impact of care and the quality of care, and you can't, just, you can't show that by ethnic, ethnicity when you know there's already inequalities, that is a form of indirect discrimination, but we don't seem to apply the legal framework that we, we already have to some of the challenges that, 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 that we, we, we face. And similarly, you know, when, you, when you've got um, somebody, uh, you know, a black man being um, seven times more likely to, um, to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or four times more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health, Mental Health Act, We've got we've got some data. We also have, as as Jabir pointed out in, in, in earlier on, and that is still the case, certainly in my area, mental health, where there's lots of data that when it's produced, it's just got missing. Where it got ethnicity, or it's in, it's incorrectly recorded. I slightly found that when I was doing my PhD, which was like with this, um, Caribbean women, and often in the notes it was said they were Caribbean, but they weren't. They were African women because somebody just looked at them and decided which for themselves which category they belonged in. So there's got to be some again going back to the political world. There's got to be some drivers from the top that says this is this is not appropriate, and you need to collect correct data. And there have to be some sanctions because if it's just going to be a nice thing to do, it doesn't happen, does it? There needs to be some sanctions about uh, making sure that people produce the data that's, that's required. Laya, I don't know if you just want to comment as well, yeah. Yeah, so I think found that this lack of data, it's definitely a, a, a manifestation of racism. So, yeah. And, I agree with Javier that just documenting inequities is not enough to reduce them, but we do need thorough and good data on ethnicity in order to document inequities so that we can act on them. And I don't think it's just in terms of healthcare records to be able to demand, as Don said, appropriate or correctly recorded and published a data on ethnicity, but we also need data on the determinants of ethnic inequity. So we need data on racism and how racism is leading to ethnic inequities in health and healthcare. Uh, and so I think pushing for data on ethnicity, accurate, and that it's available to the public, but also thinking about what are the drivers that lead, you know, that lead to ethnic inequities in health. How do we capture racism? Um, and so I think it's not just about data on ethnicity, but on the mechanisms as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to point out that, you know, a lot of these inequalities are happening before people even get to healthcare services. So, you know, the data that Wire is talking about, those are the things that will tell us, like, who's in the worst positions before we even put healthcare services into the picture. So I think that's a really important point. Um, Jabir, did you want to come in on that? Just, just a quickie, um, we're about to publish a report on, on the recording of ethnicity in health and care settings, which is a parallel study to a piece of work that the Office of National Statistics are doing, funded by the Wellcome Trust. But one of the things that emerges from there is that the last time the NHS issued guidance on the recording of ethnicity was in, 20, uh, in 2001. That's over 21 years ago. And therefore, the situation we now find of, of things not being recorded, of things being misrecorded, of things, uh, <clears throat> of 
of not response, non-response as well, it's no surprise because it's not a priority. Because if it was a priority, guidance would be not only issued, but would be regularly updated. Managers would check that people are recording. Managers would check accuracy and so on. And because it's not a priority, we get the situation now where sometimes the data is useful, often it's not useful. And even when you are able to do something with it, there's always a worry. So that Care Quality Commission data that I published showed you uh, around 14% of, of their data is in uh, uh, <coughs> ethnicity isn't reported. So even when you can use it, there's, there's a significant group of people who are missing from there. Yeah, I mean, that is going to be a really great report, Well, not great, as in the sense that the findings are not great in themselves, but I think that's a really important report, Jabir, because that is shocking that for 21 years, the NHS has not published guidance on how for its staff to record ethnicity. And I remember when Laya, I and others did a report for the NHS Race and Health Observatory about ethnic inequalities in healthcare. And I checked the, um, I think it's called Health, Education England, which is like a tra online training portal for healthcare staff, which may now be changing. But there wasn't even a module like an online training that you could take to to see, you know, uh, you know, something basic about how would you ask someone about their ethnicity, how would you record it. So I was quite shocked at that. But I think what you've just said to me is really just driven it home as to how you know how low priority this is for for healthcare services. Um, so I'm going to go to the audience questions just a little bit earlier because we've got quite a few audience questions. So um, I'll just scroll back to the top. So we've got a question from Rebecca and why you talked about there's you know some ethnic minority people in certain sectors might have been be at increased risk of exposure to COVID. Um, and she says she recently attended a council meeting in Tower Hamlets that revealed that there, 70% of their health and social staff, uh, care staff are from ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, and what can be done to protect these people now, or is it too late? Has the damage to these communities already been done? And I think that's a, that's a really good question. So not, not just for Liar, but for others as well to come in on. I think, I mean, protecting the communities in terms of COVID, I think we, yeah, the reality, we, we are not in a post-COVID pandemic, but I think maybe the focus has shifted to this cost of living crisis and protecting communities in that sense uh, may mean ensuring secure employment and fair pay, addressing discrimination within employment settings, and not just institutional, racism but also interpersonal racism that the workforce may experience from from uh, service users and peers so protecting the community this community in terms of the cost of living crisis may look different than in terms of of the pandemic but still the responses are racialized because that the protection is not coming and as as don mentioned the cats will disproportionately impact on minoritized ethnic communities. And so I think that the, the causes are similar, that racism is leading to an underprotection of communities. And I think Kamari Jones, in her definition of institutional racism, says that it often manifests as inaction in the time of need. And so I think this is, if, if communities are not protected by legislation and, and by cats, then um, yeah, how to protect them then? increase the financial stability. Yeah, well, thanks very much for that live. If Don or Jabir want to come in on that as well, please feel free. The Dami, <clears throat> I, I recently had an article published in Care Talk about, about the experience of, of uh, frontline care workers. Um, <clears throat> and I've pointed out that uh, in the latest data we've had, while there were around 960 deaths of, of healthcare workers uh, during the COVID pandemic, there were actually 12, 1,252 deaths from of, of frontline care workers uh, in the pandemic, but it, it's not reported. 
And the reason it's not reported is clear if we look at what the EH, EHRC inquiry has shown. They're much more likely to be women. They're much more likely to be from minority ethnic background. They're much more likely to be uh, on zero hour contracts. So the, the most fragile type of employment as, as well. As a consequence, they're less likely to be unionized. They're less likely to know, know their, their rights as well. So you've got a really vulnerable group who are then charged with looking after another really vulnerable group. And as somebody said in a, in a, in a conference I once attended, the poor are looking after the poor. Uh, and, and it creates a situation where we, we don't give it the attention that we do. And then we, we bring to the fore things like the Workforce Race Equality Standard, which is a really important step forward for the, for the healthcare system because it became part of the standard contract in NHS. But it spends all its time looking at what's happening at the senior levels, what's happening at, at chief executive level and so on. And while that's important, that's not where the majority of Black, Asian and minority ethnic staff are. The majority are in the lowest grades and until we, we, we focus our attention on improving action there, <clears throat> experiences there, we, we're going to repeat this, this problem of, of not really challenging racism. Yeah, and I think for, with the workforce race quality standard as well, like people like bank staff and like short term contracts who actually short term contract staff who work in the NHS are not counted in that. And I completely mm -hmm. agree with you that in the care sector, the inequalities are much worse but we just don't have as much data about that. But if we had the full data, which kind of the Equality and Human Rights Commission recommended that we should have, we would see actually that sector is in much more dire need of support for its ethnic minority staff than the NHS is, I think. Um, Dawn, sorry, you were going to come in. No, that's just fine. Just I was going to, to add to that really, that, you know, what the Workforce Race Equality Standard or the RES shows is that you can have fantastic policies and procedures, but if people don't enact them, they're not worth the paper they're written on, are they? Do you know what I mean? They're just, uh, they're an exercise in, uh, as Jibri is saying, collecting data that serves a particular purpose, but doesn't actually drive the change that we all here want to see. So again, just thinking about the pandemic and how the, the number of people who actually had um, risk assessments, the number of organisations where they actually undertook proper risk assessments of their frontline staff using, you know, kind of race, using an equality impact assessment to, to recognise the fact that some groups are much more likely to be affected. I, I don't even know if we've got the data on that. I, I certainly know the people I've spoken to in, in local organisations and they, they didn't even know that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. So, we, we have policies and we have procedures, I mentioned the Equality Act, you know, we've got res, but somehow there's a disconnect between that and actually looking after the people who are looking after the people, let alone looking after the, the you know, the, the, the people in the communities. So it, it just feels like within the system, this is really manifestations of structural, institutional, ingrained, endemic racism it's everywhere so the people who are providing the care are themselves being let down and being being treated unfairly and unequally and then the people that they're caring for are also at increased risk of being treated unfairly and unequally yeah well, have you got any comments on that or we can go to the next question it's, yeah um, so just to, uh, I'm just going to try and put some of these questions together. Sorry if I don't say your question exactly, audience members. So I think a couple of people are, are talking about, um, there's actually, so Jabir, you mentioned about kind of community action and people in the community doing some of the work, taking things forward to address these racial inequalities. But there's a feeling that, you know, how much can community members actually do with kind of low resources, emotional burden that they're already under? And I suppose this come back to, comes back to that kind of argument about who's best to provide services to ethnic minority groups. You know, should there, there, sh there should be provision within the NHS so that they're treated equally. But actually, we know that lots of people prefer to go to places like the Race Equality Foundation and other ethnic minority-led organisations to kind of 
get some support, um, not maybe directly with healthcare, but other things too. So yeah, just a, a comment from the panel really on, you know, is it the community's job to address these inequalities and what should we be, you know, what should really be the case? What, what would be ideal? If I go to Jabia first, oh, sorry, oh. Dom, you've, You've un, you've no, I'm just going to say it does feel as though often that's the case that, that, that it's been pushed back on the communities. So we had during COVID communities were being blamed for the disproportionate impact on uh, of co the, the, um, of the virus on them because it was because they were overweight and didn't exercise enough and lived in overcrowding. You know, so it was all pushed back. So it was at an individual level or at a community level rather than uh, seeing it as structural. And it's not uh, uncommon that, for example, you know, people who are leading research, so look at us on here, um, or, or at the forefront of EDI work are also themselves from ethnic minorities, from racialized and minoritized groups. And sometimes that may, I think I noticed somebody's mentioning gaslighting. It happened to me only this week when I was talking about this and somebody from a, you know, very high up, um, essentially was against, was saying that this is not, this is not a real thing. You know, we, we health education England is doing all of this stuff and really coming back with a, with a, with a rhetoric, which bears no relation to, to my reality or the reality of the people that I, that I do work with. So I think it, 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 we are all here. We've paid, I pay my taxes. I'm a member of society. And if I choose to go somewhere else, that's fine. That should be my choice. But the statutory provision should be able to meet my needs. And if it, if it doesn't, then that to me is a, is a manifestation of, of structural inequalities. Jabir Alaya wants to come in that comment on that, please feel free. So it, it's uh, going back to Stuart Hall. One of the problems sometimes when you start talking about racism is that it becomes a council of despair, that that things are really difficult or things are getting worse and, and nothing can really change. But but sometimes it's important to recognize the things that did change or have changed. So not so long ago, uh, <clears throat> sickle cell and thalassemia was rarely discussed in mainstream literature, was rarely discussed as requiring national action, was rarely discussed as, as being something that uh, all, all GPs and medical practitioners need to be aware of and so on. And it meant real life-threatening uh, issues for those people who did, ha did have sickle cell and thalassemia. But through the action of voluntary organisations and the community, eventually a national screening programme was established. Better guidance and training for uh, GPs has been produced. Better treatment ha has happened as well. We've not gone as far as we should do. So things like, you know, some one thing we suggested not so long ago was, <clears throat> was uh, addressing heating costs because we know the cold is, is, a, is a real risk factor for, for people with sickle cell. Uh, th those things haven't been done, but it is the case that it's not where we were uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Things ha ha have changed. Secondly, I think the, the experience with Marcus Rash Rashford has to be identified as being another uh, uh, example of of using community-based ideas to bring up, bring about 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 change, and I think the way he has pressured and the way people have supported him to pressure that change is something that we all need to learn from and think about how how, how do we build on that? Uh, not get confused with trying to identify influencers or leaders, but understand the leadership that he's provided that that's brought about that change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Laya, sorry. During the Black Lives Matter movement, many institutions, including universities, had these bold statements about addressing racism and working towards racial equality. And I think in terms of accountability, where, why, where is this now? So how did these statements translate into action, into long-term uh, outputs and action? And, so I think, yeah, the, the, and I think this was motivated by communities, you know, the activism around Black Lives Matter movement, but 
given the, these statements from big institutions, very white institutions, then I think some accountability in terms of how is this then translating into actual long-term uh, action around, around addressing racism. Yeah, and I think, yeah, we cannot, can't deny the community efforts and kind of activist efforts that go into making sure that these issues are raised to enough importance to be actually uh, recognised by people who have some ability to change it. Um, so I'm going to take just a another question. Um, I've got a question from the audience that says it feels like the NHS is broken intentionally. Um, and have you got insights on the the staffing challenges for ethnic minority people generally, and specifically for those trusts who couldn't afford it. So the, the audience member is referring to the direct recruitment of nursing staff, for example, from Asian countries and the implications that this has for racism. So for example, it feels like this recruitment can be on lower terms and conditions, and that in itself is racist. And then also kind of what happens when these people start working in the NHS, so the racism that they can suffer from British patients, from British patient, patients in the NHS. So if, if any of you want to kind of come in on that. I, mean, I think the workforce race equality standard uh, that is reported by the NHS does report um, increased bullying, harassment and discrimination by patients and uh, staff towards ethnic minority members. I was just discussing that with my PhD student this morning, actually. Um, but yeah, we have, there is a staffing crisis in the NHS as there is in many other sectors, but I suppose, do we, do we think that this is affecting ethnic minority staff in a different way than it is, uh, say, white staff who are newly recruited? I don't know if you've got any insights from the mental health sector, Dawn, if that's um, something that's come up there. Um, hmm. So I, I, th I think we can look at this in, in a different way different levels can't we so to fix your own problem by going to countries where they have they don't even have enough people to provide their own health care and attract those people to come to your country leaving those countries poorer for health care i think that is that's morally questionable and I, I, absolutely people have the right to travel and to work wherever they can and to use their labor to get to get a better quality of life i have no problem with that but to not invest or to not invest enough in growing the workforce in your own country, that means that you then have to go abroad to go and recruit people from countries where they don't have enough health care. I, I think that's problematic. And you're right, when people do come to the UK, it, it is like Javier said, you know, we have people who then don't necessarily understand the system and then maybe are less likely to be unionised, less likely to, to understand their rights and therefore more likely to 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 come to be compliant so um i'm sure the you know the covid inquiry i'm hoping it would bring this up but certainly there have been some um anecdotal evidence about um frontline um staff like medics in particular who were being asked to work longer with worse quality ppe and stuff and didn't feel able to speak up so I think yes, there is within, within all of the system, the, the thread through it all is is racism. However, it's, it manifests itself, and the, there are many different versions of that. Yeah, Shabira or liar, any comments on that? No, me. If, if if you allow me to get on my on my hobby horse, um, we we unfortunately for a very long time, uh, and this includes the 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 previous Labour government as well, have had a, a, an obsession with the market. We've assumed that one of the ways to achieve efficiency is to introduce competition within health and care. And by introducing competition, we'll be able to, to hopefully improve quality, but at the very least, we'll be able to drive, drive down, down, down costs. But the introduction of the market has undermined a key fundamental about good quality health and care, which is collaboration. The more you're able to work with people, the more you're able to actually achieve that. So, for example, an acute <coughs> a hospital working with their GP to better understand what the particular patient needs is the way to achieve the best outcome for them. However, if 
the GPs having to question whether or not he can afford to send that patient to a particular uh, uh, for a particular test or a particular uh, operation, you create a situation where it's become uh, the market that's driving it rather than what what's best uh, for them. And we we find ourselves in a situation where we're having to constantly think about competition rather than collaboration. And now we've we've decided that it's finally that it's too difficult. And then we're going to create this in, in integrated care system. But again, we've not dismantled the market. We the market is still there, and it's still undermining uh, people, <clears throat> and it's manifesting itself now in what's happening to the workforce. We've closed ourselves off from European employees, but we're now going to go further afield and 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 undermine. Uh, healthcare in in Africa and and Asia by bringing the trained people uh, from there here. Yeah. Well, are there any final comments on that? No. So I'm going to wrap up there, um, just so that we have a prompt finish at six thirty in case people have to uh, be elsewhere. Um, I just want to thank all the audience for their excellent questions. I tried to get as many of them as I could across to the panel. Um, and I hope some of the, the discussion also answers some of those questions. I think what we've heard today from our speakers and during the discussion has given us really a lot to think about in relation to how we can continue to tackle the crises that have been going on, not just since the COVID pandemic, but before that. And really we've highlighted the important roles that lots of different um, people have, so researchers, activists, the voluntary sector, they all have a role to play in making sure that we do that. Um, and finally, I just want to say a big thank you to Laya, Jabir and Dawn for their really insightful presentations and to the Stuart Hall Foundation for organizing tonight's event. Um, I think it's been a really great discussion, so thanks very much. And um, it's just a good night from me and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.